Thank you for joining us. Today, we are going to have our inaugural lecture of the World Community Grid Lecture Series. This lecture will take about 12 to 15 minutes with time available for a question and answer session. At this time, please welcome Victor Zverstis, an IBM employee who has been one of the leading members of World Community Grid since before it began in 2004. Hello. Uh, I'm one of the team working behind the scenes on worldcommunitygrid.org, which has been harvesting fair processing time from computers around the world for six years now, putting those computers to good use while they would otherwise be consuming electrical power just waiting for that next keystroke or mouse movement. One of the research projects on World Community Grid is the Fight AIDS at Home project from the Scripps Institute in La Jolla, California. They have been running their research on World Community Grid for about five years now, and they've been able to greatly raise the level of their work because of the over one-eighth of a million years of processing time generously provided by members to this project. Please let me introduce Dr. Alex Perriman from the Scripps Institute, who will tell you about the science in this exciting research on fighting AIDS using worldcommunitygrid.org. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. And I'm Dr. Alex Perryman, a postdoc in Professor Art Olson's lab at the Scripps Research Institute. There are currently around 33 million people living with an HIV infection. Around 2 to 3 million people get a new infection each year, and around 2 million people died from AIDS in 2007. Throughout the entire epidemic, over 25 million people have died of HIV, which makes AIDS. Today I'm going to tell you about how the World Community Grid helps us help you, and I'll present some new results on some virtual screens we've done against HIV protease, HIV integrase, and then I'll briefly talk about what happens after these experiments are done. The World Community Grid provides free computational resources for projects that benefit humanity. Thus far, we've received over 123,000 CPU years for the Fight at Home project. To put that in perspective, humans have only existed as a species for about 35,000 to 100,000 years, and we've already got more CPU time than that in the last five years on the World Community Grid. This massive amount of resources allows us to really swing for the fences instead of just aiming for singles. We can investigate many more compounds than we could have otherwise. We can screen hundreds of thousands to millions of compounds instead of just being able to dock a few thousand and we're able to screen a huge amount of compounds against many more confirmations and different types of superbugs of the targets. We can also perform more aggressive and more ambitious experiments instead of just aiming for the, the little incremental progress that a lot of people work on. Now, these are the, the main direct benefits, but we also have a huge indirect benefit. Uh, since we've been given these, these terabytes of screening data, that motivated us to create new tools that are able to handle this massive amount of data. So these tools we share freely with other scientists. So it helps us uh, not only accelerate our own research, but it helps thousands of other scientists accelerate their research against HIV and other diseases. On Fight AIDS at Home, we auto dock compounds to find candidates. A candidate is a, a potential hit or anchor. So it's the, uh, the foundation for a compound that could later be made more complex and more potent to turn into a drug. But these candidates or hits are, are, are much weaker and smaller and simpler. They tend to be like micromolar binders. Whereas if it turns into a real drug, we need to make it a thousand to a million times more potent so that, so that it's a, a nanomolar or picomolar binder. Now, the details of the docking calculations I can come back to later uh, if you're interested. HIV protease is one of the key drug targets from HIV. It cuts the viral protein into the separate components so that they can fold up and do their evil deeds. When you block HIV protease, then that helps prevent the spread of the infection to other cells within that HIV patient. The most important thing is that the introduction of protease inhibitors combined with the reverse transcriptase inhibitors to the AIDS cocktail significantly reduced the death rate associated with HIV. Before they had protease inhibitors, HIV was basically a death sentence. Now that we have the protease inhibitors combined with the other types of AIDS drugs, then patients are able to live years to sometimes decades with a decent quality of life. Although we have a lot of great drugs against HIV, the problem is the multi-drug resistant mutant superbugs appear quickly and they keep getting worse. So if you look at a study from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine where they looked at the strains of HIV that people were becoming infected with, you can see that from just 1995 to 2000, the frequency of strains that are able to highly resist one particular drug increased about three to four times. 
the frequency of strains that can resist many different drugs at the same time increased about five times in just those five years. So drug resistance is already a huge medical problem, and it keeps getting worse. On Phytase at Home, one of the main targets that we've been screening against is HIV protease. Uh, here you can see the exact same version of one particular target. This is the backbone, or, or the, the skeleton, basically, of, of the molecule, whereas here you can see all the atoms, and we're looking at the surface. Now, when we screen against HIV protease, we actually use three slightly different types of experiments to target four sites. Uh, since HIV is a dimer composed of two identical halves that come together to form this enzyme, when we screen against, say, the allosteric site here, we also do a parallel experiment where we screen against the allosteric site here. Or the second allosteric site here, we then do another experiment that targets the second allosteric site here. And a lot of our experiments also target the active site, the hollow center shown here, and this is where all the current HIV protease drugs find. But when these drugs bind, they stabilize this conformation with the closed structure of the flaps. When these flaps are able to open up, like before the drug or substrate gets there, then a new site is created called the I site, which I'll show you in the next slide. Now, the I site is the region found between the tip of a semi-open flap and the top of the wall of the active site. This has been shown to be a promising new target for potential HIV protease inhibitors, uh, which was initially discovered by Kelly Dam and Heather Carlson at the University of Michigan, where they used computational experiments to find this magenta compound and predicted that, that it would bind here, and it has been shown to actually inhibit HIV protease in the test tube. However, they don't actually have a crystal structure that, that tells you, uh, that confirms exactly where and how it binds. What we've done is we did these uh, fragment-based Screens, the ones that we discovered those allosteric inhibitors about that are talked in this chemical biology and drug design paper. And in the supporting information, we talk about this 5 nitrile involt fragment that we crystallized with a semi-open state in this eye site. We then took this crystal structure, and we've been using it on five aids at home in experiment 28, and then we've uh, uh, docked over 12,000 different compounds from the Cambridge commercial vendor against these semi-open states. And here you're looking at some of the compounds that bind well to this semi-open conformation. Um, and here, this is the, uh, the wild-type strain that's present in the U.S. and Europe, but we also screened it against semi-open confirmations from the strain that's found in Africa. We screen, screened it against the strain common in Asia, and we screened it against many different multidrug-resistant superbugs. Here I'm showing one representative one, where you can clearly see that some of the uh, regions of these compounds are poking up into that eye site. If you look at the surface mode, you can actually see that white space, that daylight, where the eye sight is uh, accessible because the flaps are semi-open. You rotate that molecule towards you and look from the top, you can see the ligands poking out from those two little eyes that we're now screening against. Now we screen these compounds against both the semi-open states and also the structures with the closed flaps because we're trying to find new compounds that combine well when the flaps are closed or when they're semi-open. So the current protease drugs that bind in the active site are known to pay this massive energetic penalty to force the flaps to close. So we're trying to find new compounds that combine well to both closed and semi-open in order to hopefully not have to pay that massive energetic penalty. It's one of the ways we can try to get around the mechanism of drug resistance that uh, we've seen. And when you're looking at these closed confirmations, you can see that those eye sites are no longer accessible. So we screen those 12,000 compounds against many different confirmations or shapes of different superbugs and then the wild type strains from the U.S., Europe, Africa, and Asia, we've identified 18 compounds that bind well to both the closed and the semi-open state. So we'll soon purchase these compounds and then our collaborators will test them in the uh, wet lab assays and test tubes and cell cultures. The other screens we've been doing on Fight AIDS at Home, we've recently started targeting HIV integrase. HIV integrase is another key drug target. It basically cuts two nucleotides off the viral DNA and then attaches that viral DNA to the human DNA in two separate reactions, the three-prime processing reaction and the strand transfer reaction. The HIV integrase drug Weltegravir has been shown to help treat AIDS patients who are not responding well to previous anti-HIV cocktails. Now, the advanced HIV integrase inhibitors, such as Weltegravir shown here, use three oxygen atoms shown in red to bind to these two magnesium ions shown in green. These other two compounds are currently in clinical trials, and these are all strand transfer inhibitors that bind to the two magnesium states. And although Rotegavir was only approved in 2007, 
there are already drug-resistant mutant superbugs that have been found in patients. There's also, uh, unlike HIV protease, where there is a, a large amount of atomic detailed structural data on where exactly the drugs find and how they block HIV protease, for HIV integrase, there is no 3D structural data available that shows exactly how well Tegavir is able to bind it and work. So before we could screen against HIV integrase, we had to develop new protocols that allowed us to create a more accurate model of this drug binding state. And those details are published in this Journal of Molecular Biology article. On-site AIDS at home, we're doing three different types of experiments against HIV integrase. Now, in one flavor, shown over here on the right, we actually uh, used the models of one of the most Roltegravir-resistant superbugs, shown here in red, and we docked the current drug Roltegravir against all those different confirmations of the mutant and the wild type, and then picked the particular shape that Roltegravir bound the best against, and now we're screening against these targets on site AIDS at home to find new strand transfer inhibitors. A uh, riskier screen for the census type of experiment we've, we've been doing is experiment 33, where we're trying to find compounds that combine underneath this loop near the active site and lock it into the inactive state. So those would be potential allosteric inhibitors, which would be a breakthrough new class against HIV if we can find some that actually work. In these experiments, we're also targeting the one magnesium model to try to find compounds that combine the one magnesium and prevent the second magnesium in the DNA from getting there. And that's what we're doing in experiment 33. So in experiment 33, we've now identified 12 potential 3' processing inhibitors from the Azinex library compound that are able to bind to the one magnesium model and hopefully prevent that second magnesium from getting there. And we've identified one compound that can bind underneath this loop and be a potential allosteric inhibitor. So these compounds have now been purchased and uh, are being tested by our collaborators in Professor John Elder's lab. Thus far, we've screened almost 700,000 compounds against many different shapes of HIV integrase on World Community Grid. We've analyzed the first 1,000 results in detail, and 12 of these compounds uh, are predicted to have some good activity against integrase. Ten of those we bought from Azinex, the other two we can get from the National Cancer Institute, which provides compounds for free. And I've also recently searched and found 240 compounds that are structurally similar to these 10 that are currently being examined in new docking studies, and then we'll order some of those to test those in these three prime processing assays to try to find new HIV protease inhibitors, new HIV integrase inhibitors. So after we do these experiments, our part is down here in the Olsen and structure and modeling where we try to find these hits. Then we pass off the compounds to the Torvit and Elder labs who actually do the wet lab assays. If that's shown to actually work in the wet lab assays and be a real inhibitor, then those compounds are given to Dave Stout Lab where they try to find the atomic three-dimensional structure. Then we use that structure with the medicinal chemist to try to turn that weakly binding hit into a much more potent lead or drug. We have to make it a thousand, a million times more potent. This is a process that takes many years at each step and a lot of persistence, uh, but we definitely have some promising new results. We need to thank Art Olson's lab, uh, uh, who I work in, uh, Stefano Forley, who's a key member of the Fight at Home team, all of our wet lab collaborators listed here, IBM and the World Community Grid team listed here. Special thanks to the World Community Grid volunteers like you, and if you're not yet one of the volunteers, you can join us at httpworldcommunitygrid.org, or you can go to fightaidsathome.scripts.edu and follow the link to worldcommunitygrid.org. I also need to thank the NIH and some of the uh, stimulus funds for paying for our salaries and for allowing me to keep my job and keep doing this research. Uh, thank you very much, and now turn my time over to Victor and welcome your questions. Well, thank you, Alex, uh, for a very informative talk uh, about the uh, Fight AIDS at Home project running on World Community Grid and increasing our awareness of how we are helping on World AIDS Day. I hope those listening will all contribute their spare computing power and join worldcommunitygrid.org and uh, help out with this project as well as others.